Welcome, I'm Glenn Anderson, producer and host of this TV series, Glenn's Parallax Perspectives. This series explores a wide variety of issues related to peace, social and economic justice, the environment, and nonviolent social change. We especially provide opportunities for the public to hear voices and viewpoints that are rarely heard in mainstream media. Mainstream media, politicians, and culture see the world in conventional ways. The establishment is stuck in how they see the world. In order to solve problems, we need to see things differently. This TV series, Glenn's Parallax Perspectives, can help us see things differently so we can solve problems at all levels from the local to the global. This series is called Glenn's Parallax Perspectives. Here's what the word parallax means. Put one finger in front of your nose and another finger farther away. Close one eye, then open that eye and close the other. Your fingers will seem to move. This is called a parallax view. This TV series invites you to look at issues from fresh perspectives. Also, see much information about the issues that we cover in this TV series and previous episodes of this series at my blog, www.parallaxperspectives.org. And now I invite you to watch this month's program. This month's interview on Glenn's Parallax Perspectives will help us urge local governments to protect the environment. Environmental problems persist all the way from the global level down to the local level, even though people everywhere really do care about protecting the environment. We can think globally and act locally on this matter. This interview will help you understand why local governments often fail to protect the environment and how we can be more effective in urging them to protect it. We have three guests who are very knowledgeable and they will help us explore this topic. Cindy Beckett is a Washington State University certified master watershed steward. She's working toward earning that certification also from the Environmental Protection Agency. She works hard as a volunteer helping people protect local water resources and she's earned a great reputation as an excellent source of expertise and inspiration for that. Good to have you here, Cindy. Thanks Thank for being a guest. Ty Menser graduated with honors from Harvard with a degree in government. He's also a lawyer who has practiced law in several specialties and several different states in the U.S. He served several years on Thurston County's Water Conservancy Board. During the past few months, he's talked with a great many people throughout Thurston County to find out what problems they see at the local level and what they want local governments to do. Good to have you here, Ty. This will be fun. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks. Helen Wheatley is well-respected locally and regionally as an expert on several kinds of environmental problems. She has a strong understanding of environmental science and she explains it clearly so people can understand it. She has special expertise on environmental issues in our local Thurston County area. Helen, good to have you here. Thank you, Glenn. So, let's just start with kind of a broad context. Uh, I keep seeing reliable evidence that our water, land, air, wildlife, fish, and other aspects of our environment are in really extreme danger. And I wonder, Helen, can you uh, give us like a, an overall view of the current condition and the trends underway, and then we'll later get into examples. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question to start with, Glenn, yeah. but um, I think it, we can certainly say that when it comes to local governments uh, facing the problem of protecting the environment and trying to find the motivation to protect the environment, uh, it was never more true, the environmental dictum, that everything is connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. I think we're really seeing that these days. Um, the pace of change has accelerated, and that's hard for local governments to cope with, I think. Um, local governments are dealing with the consequences of past policies um, to a degree uh, where I think some elements of those past policies have really come to a crisis point. Um, I think that uh, there's a, Washington State's a little bit of an unusual place uh, compared to a lot of states where many people may have come from in that the role of local governments is really essential in protecting 
the environment, and yet at the same time, uh, of course, we're all facing a situation f where support for doing that f at the state and federal level is becoming more and more difficult to rely on. Uh -huh. And so I think that set of conditions <laughs> is kind of bringing us to something yeah. of a perfect storm yeah. where I think we really yeah. need to think hard about uh, coming up with some new ideas yeah. and new approaches. Yeah. And when we do these uh, interviews on, on TV here, we always have daunting problems. And yeah. my sense is always that if people are thoughtful and informed and motivated and skillful, we can devise strategies to solve the problems. And so it's, it's always a can-do attitude, uh, no matter how bad the, the problems are. Overwhelmingly, the public really does want uh, the environment to be clean and healthy and sustainable. Uh, the private sector left to their own devices will not do it because the private sector is always looking for a short-term profit and they're not looking to serve the broad public interest uh, in this way. And so that's why we need governments to do things and all the way from the national to the local level and the local levels are the ones that are most accessible. And uh, I know Ty, you've been talking with a lot of people lately uh, throughout the local community about what problems they see locally and what they want governments to do about the environment or other issues. Sure. Can you share what you've been discovering? Sure. Um, the thing that I think the citizens are most identifying most frequently is just a concern about the population growth that we're, county numbers say that we're going to grow by 100,000 people in Thurston County by 2040. And folks are seeing that. Um, in their communities and they're concerned about how we're going to protect natural resources in light of this growth because the growth is going to come with development and it's going to come with pressures on our open spaces and water um, and so people are concerned of, of whether we're equipped to, to handle that kind of population. It's a 40 percent increase. Mm -hmm. A second issue is water issues. I think um, clean water issues are, are important um, for a lot of the people that I talk to. You know, they, they read about it whether, you know, they read about all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's kind of an umbrella topic to cover so many different things. We, we see about the, you know, issues with animals and fish. We see um, pharmaceuticals in the water. We see, you know, uh, bud inlet and shoots watershed having different kinds of water quality issues. They read about um, toxic algae and Summit Lake and closures and, yeah. and, and, and what that's all about. So. Um, those are issues I think that people are kind of wondering, what is our government doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, be, Cindy, Cindy, you developed a lot of really powerful track record and an excellent reputation for somebody who knows the laws and the regulations thoroughly um, about environmental issues and especially water. And you've helped a lot of people protect local streams and wetlands. How did you get into this? What was your story for your entry point? Well, it started for me, well, first off, it started when I was literally four years old. Um, my mother could not keep me in the house. I always had to be out watching where the water was. And when it <laughs> rained hard, it came up, and when it stopped raining, it went down. I wanted to know where it was, so I would just keep digging with my little shovel to find where it went. So then you go on with life, um, and then one day, uh, across the road from me, a sign went up. With, there's a huge wetland meadow there, very large, full of wildlife, full of everything. And a sign went up, public notice, going to be 42 houses built in there. So my neighbor and I started talking about it. I said, you know, I'm sure they can't do that. I think I'm going to find out. And so it was uh, quite a, a standoff, and it forced me to say, I'm absolutely positive there are laws that protect this. And so I started delving into the laws that did protect it and uncovered where they had, the people who had said that it was, there was no water there and it was perfectly fine to build were not qualified at all to do that. They, they just weren't. Uh, so we did, the two of us um, did fight back. We would not back down. Uh, finally convinced the Army Corps of Engineers to come down and look at the situation and they, in the summertime did what's called atypical, which means the land has already been filled and they have to go down through all the top fill to get to the wetland vegetation to test to see where the water is. And they confirmed that the whole thing was not buildable. It was actually part of a waterway. Uh -huh. And so that was the end. 
<laughs> and the end of the project. The end of that project. Yeah. It just ceased to exist because they could not build there. And uh, that sort of got me started um, in following the, that waterway w to where it went and then starting into research uh, history on even that one waterway alone. And the rest of it sort of just yeah. unfolded. Yeah, and we'll, we'll follow some of those uh, unfoldings <laughs> yes. uh, as we go in this hour. Uh, Helen, I want to follow up with you about um, the, the laws. The environmental movement was strong in the late 60s and through the 70s, and we got federal and state governments to pass good environmental laws. But since then, decades ago, things have changed. Reality has sort of caught up with the shortcomings of these laws. Um, and the, the situations that may have been relevant then, we've moved beyond that. Um, and so those laws from the late 60s and the 70s seem inadequate to solve current problems. Well, what, that's, help that's, us understand that. Yeah, well, there are a couple of ways that you could approach that. In fact, I think in, in many ways, I think Cindy will, will definitely uh, agree with me here. I think those laws are still really strong and really useful in a lot of ways. And in fact, um, the more that uh, you become active in trying to protect the environment, the more you realize uh, that we don't utilize the federal laws enough in local mm -hmm. communities. And that's one of the things Cindy is really good at mm -hmm. teaching people how to do is, mm -hmm. is how to know the federal laws and use them. However, uh, there, so yeah, we, we sort of have state laws and local laws that have flowed out of those earlier laws um, that have attenuated it to some degree. The more it filtered down through the years mm -hmm. with the Growth Management Act in the 1990s and, and sort of as it filtered down, it often became attenuated as responsibility fell more and more to local mm -hmm. uh, jurisdictions that didn't necessarily have the enforcement powers yeah. that the federal government would. Yeah. And so uh, that's one of, the, one of the problems is how those things filter down to the local level yeah. and how they actually get enforced. And then another problem is that since many of the laws that we rely on, like the Clean Water Act or, or the, uh, oh, I don't know, give me another one, the Endangered, the Endangered Species, Species Act, Act are, are so old, um, they're not really based on best available science anymore. We understand much more about how things are interconnected mm -hmm. um, so that it's not just a f certain signal species, it's yeah. the whole ecosystem, for example. Yeah. So, so there's this problem of the interconnectedness of the environment. And there's also the problem that since some of those laws are about half a century old now, um, more and more we're having to look at restoration rather than preservation. And a lot of those laws are based on an idea of preserving natural environment that's already there. And we're at a point where especially with climate change, we have to begin to ask whether that's even, whether that kind of preservation is even possible yeah. unless we turn to restoration, not just preservation. Okay. Well, Sydney, let me ask you to follow up on something that, that <coughs> Helen had said about how you have these great federal laws and then sometimes by the time you get down to the state and local levels, um, they're not being actively worked. Um, how, how do you see uh, the effectiveness of local governments in protecting these, based on these laws well, and um, regulations? We have a little bit of a, an odd situation in Washington state uh, where we have the Growth Management Act, uh, which uh, granted deference to local government. But when it was granted, it didn't include the, um, any kind of wording whatsoever that said that the local government had, was required to uphold and abide by the federal edicts of the law. Mm. And um, because of that, um, the, the federal laws, if, if a person doesn't know that the overarching law is always the U.S. Code, um, then they, when they're told if they call their local planning office and say, I don't understand what you're doing, there was a creek there and now they're filling it in, oh well our people decided it was okay because we didn't class it as important enough, but the federal law says you can't do that, 
you have uh -huh. to keep that creek intact and you know try to rejoin it if you can uh, but the ability to uh, at a local level to actually make that happen it's just not there yeah there's another thing I want to ask you about um, traditionally we think about pollution as coming from this factory mm -hmm. or that factory or something and these are you know single point mm -hmm. you know somebody's mm -hmm. outfall but more and more we've discovered that that's Pollution comes from lots of places, and they refer to this as non-point yes. sources. Can you just like briefly uh, help us see that concept, and then we got more things to discuss. Well, uh, it, it's in some ways there's actually no real such thing as non-point. There's always a point. Uh, the the difference is that uh, they they people in general, not anyone in specific, have narrowed it down to where you call it a point source if you know that factory or that whatever um, slaughterhouse or something is putting specific contamination or pollution into the ground and the water and everything around then everyone can say you're the bad guy but when it's uh, non-point it's collectively everything that everybody does that ends up in those same waters yeah. and if you really want to you can if, if it was a law and our local s staff were instructed that you have to find that source, they would do so. Yeah. But it's much easier just to say, we don't know exactly where it's coming yeah. from, so it's just non-point, so we just have to agree it's there and yeah. move on with life. Yeah, yeah. and there's runoff from streets and runoff people's streets. yards and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. All kinds. Helen, I want to check with you about something. Um, a few days ago, you told me that governments are not adequately enforcing the laws and regulations. Um, can you discuss that shortcoming, why it is that uh, governments don't adequately enforce laws and regulations? Oh, well, there can be so many reasons yeah. for and that. And we only have limited time. <laughs> but Yeah. Well, I think that when you're thinking about it in the context of local government, I think that uh, one really excellent example, of course, is um, ca the Capital Lake situation mm -hmm. in the Deschutes River. because. Let's just start with this issue of jurisdictions. And it's, this is what makes it, you know, even though so much responsibility in this state in particular devolves to the local community to enforce environmental laws, it is often very hard for your average citizen to know where to go to even ask to have the laws or what they think might be the laws enforced. Because first of all, there's the question of, the jurisdiction over that particular issue. And that can be a real mixed stew, especially in a place like Olympia, where even the land itself is an amalgam of port land, city land, state land. You know, you've tribal, got tribal, land. tribal land, you've yeah. got um, yeah. state tide uh, lands, you've yeah. got federal water channels. I mean, it just goes on and on, yeah. and it all layers on top of, of itself. Yeah. And you may think that uh, that one agency has jurisdiction and then you, when you look into it you might find that they ceded lead, the lead to that to some other agency. And so, so just the maze yeah. of finding your way through that if you're concerned about a particular place yeah. in a particular community yeah. can be quite a complicated uh, web so, just to start so, right there. So like even if it's, if it's state jurisdiction it's like which agency uh, yes, Department and did they lease resources? the land? Is this, uh, yeah. now we have Department of Enterprise Services, or is it Fish and Wildlife? Uh, all these different agencies, everybody has a hand in it, and it's like the buck stops nowhere, it seems. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the government's inadequate authority to enforce. Can you tell us some more about the, the, the lack of authority? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I can give you a very good example. It sort of explains it all. So I can take it down to my own county, and I know it's the same in every county because yeah. I work with people and, in and all the counties. And you're in counties. Pierce County. I'm in Pierce County, county north of but us. But I know that Thurston is the same, and I know that um, King is the same. They're all it all works the same way. So the local government is charged with the on the ground responsibility for the uh, for the resources to protect them. Uh -huh and to enforce violations. The problem in Pierce, and as I research other counties, I find it's exactly the same, 
when the county wrote their development codes and all the county, every code, everything that has to do with running a county is put under county code. Well, unless they actually reference either the state or the federal code with it, a court can't enforce a county code. Oh. And so people will call and jump and rant and you name it, trying to, you know, stop the bulldozers and stop the actions that are destroying the water, and they will go to uh, higher than the, the planning department who has the initial enforcement authority, and they can't do anything, and so then they start going up. They go to the council, and they go to the executive, and they go, and they all keep saying the same thing. There's nothing we can do. Then you start calling the state, and sometimes the federal government, and they say, we can't help you because your codes are not written in anything that could be upheld in a court. Hmm. Another issue is um, enforcement mechanisms. So hmm. let's say you feel that a law, you know, be it a, a local law or a federal or a state law is being violated, um, you know, regarding pollution or a development's going in somewhere where it shouldn't or something like that. Um, the question then arises as to even if, if you know who might have jurisdiction over this, what enforcement powers do they have? Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a stream and you feel like, you know, there's Chinook that swim up that stream. Uh, there are federal, you know, there are protected species that should be a priority stream. Um, but then you find out that maybe the only way that uh, the state or the federal <coughs> government can do something about that is if somebody decides to take an action and then if they can say say no to a stormwater permit or something like that. You know, so it's very unclear where the enforcement powers are. Or another thing that Cindy just alluded to is you may want to take it to the hearing examiner. <coughs> and that's happened quite a bit in this community lately, mm -hmm. only to have the hearing examiner say, well, you don't have standing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so for a citizen to understand how to get standing or where yeah. to go if the hearing examiner says no, is really tough. And local governments have a, a, a part in that too where they may have the power to hold the hearing themselves, mm -hmm. yeah. but they'll feel like, or they may be told, well, you know, you're creating a lot of liability for, for the city if, if you go ahead and mm -hmm. try to play the role of the hearing examiner. Yeah. And so there's a reluctance. Yeah. So, you know, the, the enforcement mechanisms are, are part of that too. Di? I was just wanted to point out that anytime you have uh, separate legal schemes interacting, you get complexities. Mm -hmm. uh, and those complexities always open the avenues to multiple legal arguments, which means litigation and lawyers, and it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So if that's the route you're taking to try to enforce a particular rule or interpret the interaction between two different sets mm -hmm. of laws, it can be prohibitively expensive for the citizen mm -hmm. or the group that wants yeah. to try to, to do that, even if they have a great argument you know, and yeah. a wonderfully interesting um, you know, a legal attack yeah. on the issue that they're... I, I want to find out, thank you, uh, I want to find out from, from Cindy something and then ask Ty to, to add to this. Um, in Washington State, we have something called the Growth Management Act, mm -hmm. which you hear the name, but people, I think, don't really know what, what that's about. And we're kind of tight on time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could give uh, like a summary of the origin of it how it came into being and, and basically what it does. And then I'm going to want uh, Ty to share information and insights about various parts and how it functions in reality. Well, it's a good question. I asked that myself way back in the beginning, uh, and nobody seemed to have an answer. So I thought that I would take it upon myself to find out. Um, and I couldn't get answers from the local or state level, so I called the White House. And I asked them why they would impose such a horrific act onto this nation. They didn't know what I was talking about. Um, went through the three-step process you have to follow when you're asking a question to the White House. And a number of days later, they called me back because they couldn't find, it, it didn't exist at the federal level, and only to find out that uh, it was actually, it, the Growth Management Act itself was, uh, it actually belongs to the Master Builders of America. And they actually took the act to every state, and all the states turned it down except Florida and Washington. Mm -hmm. 
So in Florida and Washington, the Growth Management Act is uh, how they perceive the uh, state should be developed uh, to accommodate for incoming population and all of those things. But that's where it came from. So the, the origin is really from the builder's mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ty, you, there, there are a lot of parts to it. I read sure. summaries of information about it. There's lots of angles. So can you, can you Let me try to the, summarize. So it, it came aspects. to us in the early 90s. We're one of a very small handful of states, as Cindy yeah. said, that have, that have an act like this. Um, it, it basically um, gives a set of tools to local governments to try to manage growth. Uh, it, it sets up requirements to have county planning policies, and then it requires them to inventory um, critical areas and be mindful of those as they continue to grow to inventory natural resource lands, which includes agricultural, mineral, and forestry lands, to um, uh, there's a something called a concurrency requirement that requires uh, that the capital the planning for capital expenditures and infrastructure keep pace with the, with the uh, growth. It requires the uh, creation of urban growth area boundaries so that you're looking at 20 years of projected growth and you're um, identifying uh, appropriate available land that's, that's adjacent to your urban areas. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's basically trying to draw a distinction between urban growth and non-urban growth. And that's a little murky what they mean by that, yeah. but um, there's a requirement that, and there's exceptions, but there's a basic requirement that development in rural areas outside the urban growth area boundary be, be non-urban in nature. And that urban uh, growth, how, how that's defined, is confined to the, and again, there's exceptions. Mm -hmm. These are the ideas. It also created a growth management hearings board to allow challenges and allow some uh, enforcement of these principles. and. It, um, it also creates some kind of weak incentives for the local governments to comply with updating every so often the comprehensive plan um, and the, the, the other components of it. There's some, at the beginning, there, there's a little bit of stronger, there were some stronger teeth to enforce the, the initial implementation of this planning mm -hmm. apparatus. And then there's some grant money that you don't qualify for if you don't uh, continue to update in accordance mm -hmm. with the act. Yeah. So that's kind of the overall structure. Okay. I'm, uh, you have something. I, I looks like you have something to add to that. Well, um, when I compare what other states, how they've fared over the same time frame as uh, the two states who are under the the edict of the Growth Management Act, um, I actually will say that it's an abysmal failure. It truly is because uh, the growth that they're saying that has to be accommodated for um, is all the states have growth, but they don't have it at the level that, that we have it, for example, because there's a lot of uh, outside uh, the state um, go to Washington State. I actually saw a magazine one time that had a picture of a huge salmon leaping out of a pristine lake, which doesn't exist here mm -hmm. anymore, but uh, saying, come to Washington State, plenty of cheap land, pristine waters, wonderful trees and forests, and then you look around and say, where? Mm -hmm. Because they're all gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ty, wouldn't you say that uh, one of the problems with the Growth Management Act has been that it's very piecemeal? Um, that even some jurisdictions could sort of opt, I don't know if it's true now, but they could opt not to be part of it. And they wouldn't get the, the carrots, you know, if they didn't, if they chose not to be, not to create a growth management area. But, um, but so there, it's a very piecemeal approach. And, and when you say that it kind of takes the state out of it too much, I think that's very confusing for a lot of people because they sort of wonder, well, why, why isn't the state doing more? Why isn't it mm -hmm. stepping in and enforcing? Uh, why isn't there some agency of the state I can t go to about this? But it's because so much of uh, what in other states would be kind of a state responsibility devolved uh, to the local jurisdictions that adopted these Growth Management Act policies. It's not just about growth, but it's about all sorts of environmental things. There's definitely a balance that was struck between, you know, putting principles in place, but then letting local governments work out the, uh, the details. The shoreline master program requirements are exactly the same. You know, the, the policy is that every county that has shoreline has to put policies in place to, so we have some consistency. But 
it's not state level consistent consistency it is piecemeal i mean mm -hmm. some people feel yeah. it's too strong i mean at washington we definitely have we have a cultural you know um i think uh, a cultural characteristic of washingtonians of of wanting not too much top-down control and it's reflective in a lot of the policies yeah. that we have um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know I know how it works here. I don't know the state. A lot of states have no growth management act at all, right, and I, right. how it's working there is is yeah, a, it, that know, would be fun. A to, different conversation. That would be interesting yeah. to find out because it's, it's only Washington and Florida that have something based on that yes. original proposal mm -hmm. by the the builders group. So that yeah, how how do other people manage that? I don't know, uh, but but. Uh, I know when we were preparing for the program, both Cindy and Helen, uh, on several times as we were talking, talked about the, this confusion about um, who's responsible for something, who's got jurisdiction, and we've talked about that some. Um, and and any time that you have that that uh, uncertainty, it, it causes conflicts because who who's in charge? What's what's the right way to do it? Well, we don't know. We have to fight about this, you know. Yeah, and I, I'm just, it's popping into my head, you know, and uh, especially since we're all very conscious of Puget Sound right now with the yeah. whole crisis with the orcas and everything. Um, you know, another kind of outcome of that has been uh, the odd role of these regional planning boards and things like oh, that. You yeah. know, like when we go back to this concept that everything is connected uh, to everything yeah. else, but we're trying to fix it at this micro level, yeah. you know, of local, local government, then you have, you get these kind of weird in between things that yeah. are not the state, and yet there are these regional planning commissions yeah. or yeah. councils or right. boards, and where do they get their power? Uh, who chooses them? You know, there's this separation between uh, your your average citizen who thinks they're voting for somebody who has a policy of some yeah. sort, mm -hmm. and who is actually setting a lot of those policies within these layers, within layers of of yeah. government. Yeah, they get these, these these bodies that, well, we have a representative from Snohomish County, and we have a representative from Pierce County, we have a representative from the city of Seattle, we have this or that or whatever. It's like, it's like yeah, but who, you know, they, 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 the, the, there's not a, a, a clear organizational chart as yeah. to who's accountable to whom. The, somehow the, this all should be accountable to the people, mm -hmm. but it's not, it, it's, it's muddied mm -hmm. in so many ways. So I even, moved here over a decade ago from the state of Alaska, uh -huh. and it's kind of the extreme other, you know, in Alaska there's only 660,000 people, and even though it's a huge area, the people and the, I mean, things are done at the state level. Borough, they don't even have counties, they have boroughs that have m much more limited power than Washington uh -huh. counties, and you get everything done at the state level, and I have to say, there are a lot of ways in which that works really well. <laughs> You know, uh -huh. it's you know where to go. You know who's yeah. making the decision. Yeah. You get consistency in every community in the state, yeah. and there's ways in which that's effective. Yeah. And when I came to Washington, I was absolutely bewildered by what Helen's describing yeah. of trying to get a sense of how government decisions are made mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. figuring out all the different layers of government mm -hmm. is just was yeah. it was my yeah. and mind. then all these non-governmental sort of quasi and, yeah. official all kinds of regional stuff. planning. There, things. there's another area of difficulty when we talk about problems of uh, making competent decisions or enforcement and stuff that both uh, Cindy and Helen had mentioned on the phone when we were preparing. <clears throat> and that's the fact that elected officials and the staff of local planning agencies and hearing examiners and other decision makers don't have the scientific knowledge to make competent decisions and they're easily swayed by special interests. I wonder, Cindy, can you address that concern? I, I, want, I want to hear from Helen also after. I can. Um, I, the hearing examiner that we have is an exceptionally nice man. There's just nothing against that person at all. However, when you look at his legal background, it does not include anything to do with water law, for example. So he does not know, he just doesn't know. So if a county and a developer approach him saying, we want to put this through and we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and, and yet there are all these people who are objecting to it, so here it is before you, and he doesn't know. 
because he was never trained or ever specialized in that area of law. So he has to take someone else's word for it. And um, it, that, that trickles down all the way through county staff as well, where we have people in a position of saying, yeah, sure, you can fill that in and you can destroy that creek and just dig a ditch over there and say that's the mitigation. But when you actually do a background check on every one of those staff, none of them have the degrees or the state licenses that are mandatory to make those approvals. And so this is the scientific level. Mm -hmm. The first example you gave with the hearings examiner was, was not knowing the water law, mm -hmm. but there's also not knowing the, the water science. Yes. And you have to keep in mind, I mean, let's just think about somebody who's got a development going in down the street or something like that. And maybe they know enough, they probably don't, but because we're not told how to do this, but you know, maybe they know that uh, there's a wetland right there or something like that. And, and so they, they figure out how to find this online and, and they look at something called the SEPA checklist that uh, the developer had to file um, in order to, you know, as part of their permitting process. Mm -hmm. Well, the, this has been, I know in Olympia at least, this is often a source, one of the first places where there's a disconnect between what the community sees mm -hmm. and what, say, the planners see because uh, the community will say, hey, there's a wetland there. I hear the frogs singing every uh -huh. night and, and that kind of thing. Um, but you go and you look at the SEPA checklist that was contracted for by the developer. So they hire someone mm -hmm. to go out who's somehow qualified, although you don't necessarily as a citizen see yeah. what their credentials are. Um, and they don't monitor, uh, I mean, I, as far as I know, there's not really a very good system of checking on the credentials well, of these and, folks. And, and if, if the developer is hiring the person to do the, the SEPA, SEPA checklist, checklist yes. they might miss they're, some they're, things. Well, and they're going to be accountable to the person that's paying them. Yes. yes. They're, not pay, they're not accountable to right. neutral, honest science. Right. They're accountable to the developer that's paying them. There's a conflict of interest. There's, yes. a, there is a, there's kind of a built-in conflict of interest. And then, so then, that's why it matters that when it goes to the planning department of that community, yeah. that there's somebody there who can know whether uh -huh. that is scientifically adequate. Yeah. And there are many, many cases where uh, there will be a SEPA checklist submitted. The community will look at that and they'll try to go to the planning department or say city council members or county council members uh -huh. and they'll say, you know, look, our reality is not the same as that. Yeah. You know, we. We know about this stuff. We see it. Yeah. And that's the point where you start to get this uneasy feeling as a citizen that, that um, your local government that is charged with this responsibility is looking at a lot of paper, mm -hmm. but not so much at the place that the paper is about. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The, when, the uh, July program I did for this series is, is I titled base public policy on honest science and i have two scientists as guests and we talk about the problem that our government federal from the federal level on down uh are, are are experiencing with with um science deniers <laughs> making decisions as well as people who just don't know mm -hmm. the science so mm -hmm. I, you people can watch um Based Public Policy on Honest Science is the July program, and you can watch it through my blog, www.parallaxperspectives.org. Click the TV programs part, and then the science programs. In uh, it. I wanted to add one more thing on to the best available science. If you go and ask each individual person at a planning department, what does that mean? Most of them honestly don't know. The ones that think they know say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a. Well, you know, which part of the science of water running through the ground, for example, that ended up being pooled up in that wetland, uh, which part of the science are, are you educated in and you have a degree in to be able to say that it is irrelevant and it doesn't matter and is a nuisance and just fill it in and make a new one somewhere else. It'll be good enough. And yeah. they, and honestly, they never have the degrees or the credentials mm -hmm. that would have ever yeah. made it possible to do that, but they all run with it anyway. And that comes partly yeah. to this issue of resources that I alluded to at the very beginning, that if you're going to devolve so much responsibility 
for environmental enforcement mm -hmm. to local entities, mm -hmm. where do they get the support to yeah. get that best available science? Yeah. Uh, it's tough. And their budget yeah. doesn't allow them to hire yeah. real scientists. I want to right. check with Ty, thanks. I want to check with Ty about a couple other things that are relevant uh, in this area of the complexity and difficulties. Um, some governmental entities perform important functions, but they don't generate policy. They don't decide policy. Mm -hmm. They don't have the power to do that. And you served as a volunteer on the county's Water Conservancy Board from 2010 to 2013. Right. And you used your skills as an attorney, and then you studied up a lot to, to, to develop enough expertise about water-related matters so you could make competent decisions. And thank you for doing that. Right. So you're doing it right when Cindy and Helen are saying that often does not occur. Right. You did it right, so thanks for that. But even with your expertise, you, you found that the board's role did not include making policy. You were just deciding the cases that came before you. Yeah, absolutely. It's worth people noting when they're thinking about local governments and what powers exist out there. And they may do what I did when I was looking for a way to get involved in my county government. They may go on the uh, county's website and see all the different boards and Water Conservancy Board and think that's something about yeah. water conservation, mm -hmm. promotion of uh -huh. you know conservation practices. Uh -huh. yep. Has nothing uh -huh. to do with that. Uh -huh. It's just kind of a, the name, I don't know where the name came from, but it's essentially came from um, a, a frustration with the backlog of water right transfers Department of Ecology had. And so some legislators got the idea that we can train citizen boards to become sort of quasi Department of Ecology employees. Mm -hmm. And we, we're not allowed to deal with new water rights, but we can deal with transfers, mm -hmm. which is sometimes non-controversial. There's, there's still a, a deep analysis that goes into that. But anyway, it's good for people to understand that your Water Conservancy Board in Thurston County mm -hmm isn't doing maybe what you think it's doing. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just uh, kind of misnamed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and the, but the thing is that, that you actually took it upon yourself to study a hydrology, the, the water science of it, so you could make well, the Well, you right have decision. to. You have to be trained for a whole week. At the, I went to Yakima for a week with the Department of Ecology. Yeah. There's different ones at different times yeah. of the year, but you have to spend a week getting basically yeah. an overview of Washington water law. Uh -huh. And I, I was the only attorney in the room at my uh -huh. training, and I was looking around the room at people's faces and thinking, oh my God, goodness, yeah. I'm yeah. barely understanding this. I know they're not understanding yeah. it. Yeah. And it, it gave me a little pause about whether the Water Conservancy Boards were a yeah. very good idea. And, and how many more boards and commissions and quasi-governmental yeah. this and that are there out there? Right. And I wish we had more people with your competence and, <laughs> and commitment to, to, to try and do it right. Yeah. But even so, a lot of these places can't make policy because policy is done in some other way. And mm -hmm. for various reasons, the things are lacking. I want to check you about something else uh, that's water-related. <clears throat> The Washington State Supreme Court decided a case in 2016 that's referred to as the Hearst decision. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, 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 had to do with, with how counties decide to approve or deny building permits mm -hmm. uh, th that would use wells from some water source. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the Hearst decision is? Sure. What's going on with that? Because that's part of what the viewers need to understand. Sure, I'll try to keep it succinct. Um, this is another example of two different legal systems interacting and getting and, and, and coming up with some interesting new laws and requirements. So you have Washington's water law, um, which allows for a, uh, a, a well to be driven, uh, permit exempt wells are called, and it's an exception to the need to get a formal legal water right if you fall under certain criteria. And a lot of developments are done using these permit exempt wells. They're not required to go get formal legal water rights. The Growth Management Act, though, that we talked about earlier, um, has this um, overlaying um, requirement that um, planning decisions and growth planning be mindful of our natural resources and water. So the Supreme Court determined that um, the requirements of the Growth Management Act did not allow counties to issue development permits based on the, you know, water, the water scheme said it could. But the Growth Management Act is on top of that, and when you, you know, try to harmonize those two legal schemes, you get a requirement, according to the Washington Supreme Court, that a county commission um, make sure there is a legal uh, and physical availability of water before they mm -hmm. issue a development permit. Now, that was not a popular decision, and it created a firestorm, political firestorm, 
which then led to uh, a big legislative battle over a couple of years, and then it, it culminated in December where um, one party was holding uh, the, the entire budget mm -hmm. kind of hostage, you might say. Um, they weren't going to approve the budget and a bunch of important capital expenditures until there was a resolution of this, a resolution of this issue. Mm -hmm. And I use quotes because they, they really just wanted to get around mm -hmm. the requirements of the Hearst decision. Mm -hmm. And so what they came up with is a package. And we're not sure how it's going to, if it's going to work or be effective. They basically allowed counties to go back to doing it the old way, but they required a bunch of watershed planning um, to be done, and they required a bunch of money to be spent on other water restoration pro uh, projects. Department of Ecology is trying to put an emphasis on water for water um, you know, projects. There's a, there's a priority list that just came out that say what kind of projects will get the highest priority. But it's not really addressing the key issue of water availability. Yeah. And I certainly, as a county, as a potential county commissioner, would not disagree that it may not be the county commissioner's best place for that re authority to reside, but it needs to reside somewhere. Yeah. And it, you know. So again, clarity, uh, you know, there's all, everything is interconnected. And, and clarity is, is helpful and, and accountability. Well, Ellen? I just wanted to add a little side note too, you know, just to, to uh, underline the connected issue that one of the issues, you know, talking about different layers of the law, you know, one of the uh, issues about having enough water flow, enough groundwater flow, is that it feeds streams. And mm -hmm. so then you get into issues like salmon protection yeah. and you get into federal laws yeah, uh, protecting and, the salmon and tribal rights and tribal rights yeah, and all right. kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. The, my, my understanding is that water cables water tables keep dropping, mm -hmm. and 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 there's there's not enough water to go around, and everybody wants water. You want to build a new house someplace and dig a well, and and your neighbors are going to have a declining water table. You know, I mean, all, all, somehow as a civilized society, we need to find ways to sort all this stuff out, and everything seems like it's a a patchwork, uh, uh, a, a temporary fix. You know, uh, you know, slap some tape onto this mm -hmm. and hope that'll hold. <clears throat> well, information is key to an issue like this, and it's pretty, it's pretty, um, you know, depressing or deflating when people are resistant. You know, whether it's water metering or or uh, you know, accumulation of, of of the studies and the data yeah. and putting together. Uh, yeah. a mapping of, yeah. of Washington water resources. Yeah. There's resistance to these concepts yeah. and they're important. And again, we, we need honest science and not denialism and, and not have economic, my <laughs> private economic interest is to go ahead and exploit this and so what if you folks get squeezed out? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we need to function better as a community that appreciates everybody. I wanna connect with, with Cindy about some of the, the, the cool things you've been doing. Um, You've studied a huge amount. You've volunteered extensively to help people protect streams and wetlands in throughout Puget Sound area and beyond. Um, you told me that uh, people will see Puget Sound, and we we see the surface, mm -hmm. and we assume that it's okay, but we don't know what's underneath the surface, right. and we don't know what flows into it. And you assume somebody's going to take care of it. Someone help help us in. understand that kind of an angle. Well, you know, the thing is that it goes all the way to, I could go and talk to a neighbor and try to explain to them, you look out over the water, it looks like it's okay. But you have to see what's underneath there. Uh, in our issue, uh, in Pierce County, uh, and we have w everything that flows down to uh, Olympia, down Bud Inlet, is coming from us. And we had 100 years of, out of, of uh, pollution from the Asarco smelter literally raining down onto that inlet. All of that went into the sediments on the bottom. It's impossible to clean that. You cannot ever dredge out the whole inlet. So it goes back, wash, back, wash, back, wash. And then we have all the sewage treatment plants who are also issuing their cleaned water, which nobody would ever put their cup in and drink it because it would kill you. And that's all also being issued in there, but you don't see it. Uh -huh. It's not, it's like taking an aspirin and dropping it in a glass of water and it dissolves. So you think it's not there, but if you drink the water, you taste the yeah. aspirin. And so we have this issue where too many people think when you look at it, it looks pretty and clean that it is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and and one of you had mentioned on the phone as we were preparing for this interview, uh, <laughs> pharmaceuticals. People mm -hmm. take medicines, mm -hmm. and it ends up in the in the sewage. It ends up out in Puget Sound, and there's a huge amount of pharmaceutical pollution that nobody is paying attention to or measuring or. Well, the, I think that's not entirely true. I think Lot is paying attention to that, actually. Uh huh. Um, that's for people who don't know. That's the Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, Thurston. It's the sewage treatment the sewage entity yeah. for this little and, region here. And I believe they are actually doing some good uh, research. Are they? On that's that. good. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But but generally, that that's something that's you know people flush it and it goes away and in you know who knows what. And there are no sewage treatment plants that have equipment that can remove prescription drugs mm -hmm. from the water. Yeah. It's not possible. Can, we're, we're quite tight on time, but I want to have the viewers understand how you help people who are uh, contacting you for help about protecting their own local streams or mm -hmm. wetlands. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us briefly how you do this? We've yeah. got a lot of things to cover and a diminishing amount of time. In a nutshell, um, what I do is uh, help people by teaching them the laws that they need and teaching them how to run with it and fight back to protect their own peace. Um, and what I have found is it, it gains momentum if you get two or three neighbors and, and there's a little stream back there and they've loved it forever and suddenly it's going to disappear and they're fighting mad and they want to know how. So I tell them, this is what you say, these are the laws, this, this says they can't do that, and they end up amassing other people around them, and right. then they all start saying, we know the law, you can't do that. A lot of times, they all, the, the plan doesn't go through, and they end up uh -huh. saving their pieces, yeah. Yeah. which is very nice. Yeah, you, you had an example, uh, you, you mentioned to me a couple of examples. One was uh, your grandson's concern for a local creek in Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went up to visit one time and he came and said, Grandma, you just have to come and see. My friends and I found this little piece of creek and we've been trying to fix it. So I went down with them and sure enough, they had been clearing the garbage out and taking obstacles away and getting it to run again and all of that. Uh, and very, very proud of themselves. And then he said, but you need to walk up with us to see because we followed where the water was coming from and there's something wrong up there. So, and he, at that time, I think he was maybe nine or 10. Uh, and so I walked up with him and all his little friends that were trying to restore this creek. And uh, sure enough, there was a very, very serious issue. So I called, fortunately, up there, the authorities respond much more quickly and much more decisively than uh -huh. here. This is in British Columbia. British Columbia. And, uh, and so I made the phone call and said, I really think somebody needs to go and look at what's going on. And they went and said, oh no, that can't happen. And their little creek, they were all excited because the following year, their little creek was running with a lot more water and it started to get fish back in it again. Whoa. So, yeah. You, you told me also there's a, a story about stopping sewage that was being dumped on the Hancock Forest near Snoqualmie. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell us that one. Well, I was contacted by uh, a scientist, but he just wasn't um, versed in the particular science that he needed that he had been trying for several years and had been going up into the Hancock Forest and taking photographs of all this sewage uh, biosolids, but they were, there was very little to do with solid. And it was being trucked up every day in all these tanker trucks and they would just blow it out all over the forest. And he was very upset. So I said, okay, I'll help you with it. Um, and to make a long story short, uh, I ended up calling first the uh, King County sewage treatment people who said, oh no, um, our, de our ecology department said it was all okay. So I called their ecology department and said, um, I need for you to send me a copy of your, and, and I'm going to say this, it's gonna, no one will really understand it right off, but it's the list of 26 and it's a list of 126 and I need a copy of both lists. And she said, well, we have the list of 26, that's the only one we use. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you have to use the whole thing. And what these lists are is EPA publishes a list of what's acceptable to be in biosolids and what they have to test for. And one is, um, is uh, chemicals and the other one is um, biological testing that has oh. to be done for E. coli and all of that. 
Uh, and so they kept arguing back, and I kept telling them, you, can, you simply cannot do that because it says in here you're, the wetlands up in the forest will take care of it. But I'm, I have a lifetime of training with wetlands. You, uh, you can't call a forest wetland a wetland because it doesn't work the same way. It doesn't absorb impurities. It just holds the water from flooding down the mountain. That's its only purpose. And they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't listen. So finally I sent an email uh, after I prepared the list of all the stuff that was in this sewage and sent an email to the Hancock Forest owners mm -hmm. and asked them if they were aware that all of their forest was being contaminated now mm -hmm. and you cannot get the contamination back out. So all their loggers, everyone who goes in there is going to be exposed to all of this and wham, that was the end. They, they stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard it, I just heard that it stopped. So, uh, you know, that's, great. that's kind of what I do. We, we have a lot more stories. I know you, you got some help from, from Cindy yeah. regarding Moxie Creek and we're really tight on time. Uh, can, can you say something in like less than a minute? Oh, less than a minute. <laughs> I mean, it's it's we're tight on time. We got a lot of a lot of good stories, but this well, is a local Olympia issue. issue. Yeah. Well, I would say. Well, this goes to the West Bend Mill property on on Port property, and yeah. I was a citizen who uh, learned about West Bend Mill, um, became concerned because I live near Moxley Creek. I knew that that used to be the estuary for Moxley Creek, and I didn't have any idea how to approach challenging uh, that development. Um, I went to the Port Commission thinking that was the way to do it, and that was the beginning of my education about um, the, the layers upon layers. I hit a certain point where I thought that um, since uh, we had, you know, there'd been sort of a failure with. Um, getting the hearing examiner to hear what he really should have heard and uh, you know where do you go from here and so I was trying to figure that out and Cindy really helped me to understand the federal dimensions of mm -hmm. having a salmon stream and mm -hmm. she helped me she encouraged me to literally call up NOAA scientists for example uh -huh. and talk to them about fish wow. or call up fish and wildlife and so it really expanded my conception of mm -hmm. the field that that we were playing yeah. in, which is an ongoing story. Yes, good, thanks. Um, and Ty, I want to check with you about something called Sustainable Thurston. So there's a plan, and what's the intent, and how's it going? And we are really quite tight on time. Well, this is just a 2013, 14 comprehensive plan uh, went into, uh, as I understand, the most amount of money and in public input went into creating sort of a comprehensive plan looking at all aspects of community development and how we would want to, you know, using the principle of sustainability, um, what, what are policies we'd want to drive toward. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I like to bring up because it's a very, it's got a lot of good information in it and I don't, you know, it, it was created and it's powerful and people really don't refer to it as much. It's just sitting on a shelf yeah. drying dust uh -huh. and we need to keep yeah. referring to that document because it reflects our community's vision of what we want. Thurston County to look okay. like. Okay, so, so there are some remedies, and I also want to check with you, Ty, because you've been talking with so many people in the last few months, yeah. to, to, uh, and, and we've raised a lot of issues here, and, and, and you've been talking with people, and you've mentioned uh, some of the things that the public is telling you. I wonder if there's anything else you can say about what people want from the government regarding environment or other gov relevant governmental functions. Well, I just, I think that people, what people want is balance in a different in different ways. We have a very balanced um, uh, county in terms of our rural and our urban nature, mm -hmm. um, more than the counties to our you know to, yeah. that surround us. We are very balanced, but we have this infl population influx that's coming, and we're going to have to fiercely protect that balance. Um, and and it, and in, and then people a, a different kind of balance is a balance between. You know, people's individual freedom to do what they want to do and governmental, you know, mm -hmm. protection of our natural resources. And there is a desire to have, make sure that all voices are heard, mm -hmm. community input into processes, something I hear a lot about. Yeah. Um, and so that's really important when we make these decisions. Um, but ultimately, I agree with some of the comments that Cindy and yeah. Helen made about making sure that our local governments have the tools they need to enforce the laws that we have. Yeah, and I, and I also appreciate the having whatever the issue is that we talk about, that, that we ground ourselves in, in, in positive values 
and 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 valid principles rather than I'm going to get what I can at your expense mm -hmm. kind of an approach, which mm -hmm. is the way so much happens these days. But if we can have a sense of community and what the broad public interest is, you know, That's we all what, benefit from having clean water. We all benefit from safe air to breathe. And, and that's so why I encourage people to go back to that sustainable Thurston document because it, it reflects yeah. those kind of broader values. Okay. Yeah. I know I had heard about it. I've never read it. And it's still online. <laughs> it's still there. Okay. Well, good. Oh, I want to thank all three of our guests. I want to uh, appreciate what all of you have been doing. I want to thank all the folks who have been watching this interview. Um, environmental problems are serious. In many cases, uh, they're getting worse at the global, national, and local levels. We can indeed think globally and act locally. And if we equip ourselves with solid information and honest science and smart grassroots strategies, we can solve problems. All three of our guests have been doing that and they advocate for more of that. You can get information about a wide variety of issues related to peace, social justice, nonviolence, human rights, and environment through my blog, www.parallaxperspectives.org, or phone me at 360-491-9093. We are all one human family. We all share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it, and the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks. <laughs>